Hi, my name is Jeff Keeney. I'm the director of the LSU Ag Center Botanic Gardens. And today we're gonna to take a tour of Windrush Gardens. To start understanding where Windrush Gardens actually came from and originated from, we need to understand a little bit about the history of the Burden family. And to do that, let's start walking towards the house and onto the porch of the Burden home. Now, it actually started back with William Pike. Um, he purchased the property at a sheriff's sale back in 1861. Um, William had a niece, her name was Emma Barbie, and at that same time, she was engaged to a John Charles Burden. So, William Pike, being the man he was, an influencer, he decided that he would give the property that he purchased at the sheriff's sale to Emma Barbie and John Charles as a wedding gift. So after the wedding had occurred, uh, Emma and John Charles decided to move out to the property and live in the house that was already out here, um, a very simple two-room house with a center hallway. Now, they basically were a simple farm family. Uh, they raised cotton, cattle, um, and sugarcane, uh, many of the different farm commodities that we see in South Louisiana. Um, so they also um, noticed that when they looked out across the front porch, they saw a creek running through the property. And John Charles was looking at that creek and it reminded him of their home in the Cotswolds, the Burden's home. Um, the Cotswolds of England were through their property, they also had a creek and its name was Windrush. And so that's where the name Windrush comes for the property uh, that we know today. Now, John Charles and Emma um, began to raise their family. They actually had seven children uh, that they began to raise in this small house. And John Charles died a very young and untimely death right after the seventh child was born. And so Emma decided to move the children back into downtown Baton Rouge because after all, this was out in the middle of the country. Um, so she moved the family to Baton Rouge and one of the sons, William Pike Burden, uh, named after his uncle, um, fell in love with a Miss Ollie Steele. Um, now, Miss Ollie Steele had another significant figure in her life. Her dad was the state treasurer. So um, the Burden family or the media family was very connected to, to Louisiana and the community. So William Pike and uh, Miss Ollie moved out to the property and began to raise their family. Um, before they moved out to the property, they were taking many trips out here and just really fell in love with it. So they decided to get the title to the property and, and make it their home. Again, um, they raised their family in this simple uh, two-room house with a center hallway. So if we go into the house, just take a peek, um, you can kind of understand how uh, the Burden family lived. We have the dining room here on the left, um, the center hallway, which was used as the living area, and then the bedroom on the right, um, which um, everyone slept in. So the Burden family, I think we need to understand, was not a wealthy family, but they were a simple farm family um, uh, that sustained their life uh, through the farm. Now, if we come back out on the porch, we can talk a little bit more about the immediate family and where Windrush Gardens actually came from. Um, we'll start off with the oldest of the family, and that was Miss Ione. She was the firstborn child of uh, William Pike and Miss Ollie, and she was a very intelligent woman. Um, she got her degree at LSU, which was great uh, for a woman to do at that time. Not many women had been earning their bachelor's degree then. And um, she got a job at William and Mary, was there for a little while. She loved students in the university. She decided to move back to Baton Rouge and she became Dean of Student Affairs at LSU. So that's the connection to LSU, first connection that we have uh, to LSU with the Burden family. Um, the middle son uh, was Pike Burden. And Pike Burden was quite an entrepreneur. Um, he started a printing company and he won the state contract for doing all the printing for the state. So he did quite well for himself. Um, he married uh, a Jeanette Monroe, and they built uh, the pink house that you see over here uh, across the porch. And this is where they lived um, on the Burden property next to the family. Now, Pike Burden was also a World War I pilot. He had a landing strip on the property and a small plane. Um, he knew the legislator very well. Um, so it's said that during legislative session, he would actually fly to the Capitol and buzz the Capitol just to remind them that they needed to do their job. 
Um, he also had many other tales of, of, of uh, Pike's pranksterness that he played, um, but he also loved children, even though him and Jeanette never had any of their own. And when Our Lady of the Lake moved from downtown Baton Rouge, uh, they moved across Ward Creek over here just next to Windrush and uh, opened the hospital and had a children's ward. So Pike Burden was also a magician and he would go every week and do his magic tricks at the children's ward for the children. So that's Pike Burden and his tie to the Baton Rouge community. The last child uh, was Steel Burden, and Steel Burden um, was kind of the wanderlust. He loved to travel, he traveled a lot uh, into Europe, um, and this kind of started to frame um, how his career took shape. Um, Steel loved gardening and landscaping, um, he loved art, he loved architecture, and so all of these things kind of built uh, the person that he was. So in his travel, he traveled to a lot of gardens and developed some of the landscape design talents that he had. Um, he went to LSU for a little bit, but didn't finish, um, went to World War II, and then he came back and he started doing landscaping. And so uh, landscape design is where uh, Windrush kind of came into being uh, from Steel Burden. Just a little bit uh, more information on Steel Burden that we see here on the porch. Steel, as I said, was an artist. Um, he did a little sculpting. So these plaques here on the columns um, are from Steel Burden. These represent different farm scenes across Louisiana. And he embellished the porch a little bit with the shutters. If you look up at the ceiling of the porch, you see it's kind of a rosy pink color. The story goes that people used to entertain a lot on the porch in the South. This was the cool place to be. They didn't have air conditioning back then. And so Steel noticed that when women would come to visit, they would always pinch their cheeks to make them look rosy and much prettier. And so Steele decided, well, instead of a blue on the ceiling, why don't I paint it a rosy pink? And then while the women are visiting, it will reflect on their cheeks and they will be beautiful the whole time of the visit. So just kind of another little quirkiness uh, and uh, visionary of Steel Burden. Now, let's move on to uh, the landscape portion of Steel Burden and Windrush Gardens. And if we look out across the porch, um, we see a statue and a sugar kettle. Now, Steel Burden uh, started landscaping at different gardens around the city. One of the first gardens he landscaped was um, the Cottages Plantation for Mrs. Kyes. Now, Mrs. Kyes uh, asked Steel Burden, she said, Steel, um, I would really like a water feature in my landscape. And Mrs. Kyes didn't have a lot of funds. Steel didn't have a lot of funds. And so this starts to show the creativeness of Steel Burden. So Steel looked around the plantation. He found the sugar kettle and he said, hmm, what if I fill the sugar kettle with water? I'll put a statue on a pediment behind it and the statue reflects into the water and I have the water feature. So Steel Burden said to be one of the first person or the person to use sugar kettles um, and statuary together in the landscape as a landscape ornament. Um, also, we start to see part of Steele's uh, landscape design. Here we have in to frame the statue of Hebe here, we have the Japanese U. Uh, they have a very dark green cover, color and kind of a needle-like leaf. Um, next to that, we have um, the zellias on either side, kind of a layering, if you will. Uh, we move up into the landscape and we see we have um, the Japanese ligustrum, we have Japanese magnolia, and you move on up the pine trees and the crepe myrtles. So this kind of gives you a hint at the, uh, Steel Burden's uh, landscape design principles. If we start to walk to the back of the house where the first garden that Steel really created, um, we notice the pathways here. Again, the Burdens didn't have a lot of funds, so Steele used what he had, and so he used pea gravel um, to make the pathways. The other thing that he did is he, so that we can maintain the bed line, he lined all of the bed with um, monkey grass, Ophiopogon, and in some places, Lirio, or Liriope. So again, kind of this uh, design principles of steel burden. As we walk down the pathway, you see to anchor the corners of the bed, he used um, the uh, English boxwood. He also used the dwarf yopon holly. And again, to anchor the bed corners. And then you look through the landscape and we see uh, the sweet olives, the ligustrum up higher. And if we come over here underneath the ligustrum, you see the cast iron stone. 
Again, another really resilient bulletproof plant that you can use in the landscape, along with another large leaf plant um, that has another green color, the elephant ear. So again, kind of steel burdens landscape. Moving to the back of the house, um, it said that um, Miss Ollie one day said, well, Steel, if you like landscaping so much, why don't you start creating a garden here at uh, Windrush? And so thus began the first part of Windrush Garden. So if we move into this back area of the house, this was basically a part of the functioning of the farm. Um, we see a lily pond here uh, as we open up into this small yard. And this was actually where they dipped cattle. And it wasn't this exact pond, but this is where the cattle dipping occurred. Um, there was also a pig sty and a chicken coop back here. So steel began to transform this working part of the farm into a wonderful garden and landscape. So again, to see some of uh, Steele's different landscape techniques that he used and the plant material he used, if we look here in the back behind the house, um, we see these huge old crepe myrtles. So these were original to his design. These are over 100 years old. So he loved to use crepe myrtles, the peeling bark, the flowers, the bloom in the summer. Um, again, the use of azaleas uh, throughout the landscape and to uh, the monkey grass uh, to line the beds and keep the form of the bed. If we come off the circle of, and to one of the axes or the pathways, um, you're led down the path um, by a piece of statuary. And so we noticed that steel started using statuary in the landscape, just as they did in the formal gardens of Europe to help lead your eye to the next part of the gardens. And so here again, steel repurposed uh, their old well they were no longer using. On top of it, he capped it with a statue of Hermes here uh, to make a nice landscape ornament. So let's move into garden room two, um, which was the next garden that Steele Burden designed in uh, Windrush Garden. Now garden room one, we think, was designed around uh, 1920s or the 1920s. Garden room two then came into being in the 1930s. Again, some of the same landscape plant material. We have the Japanese yew art here. Um, that takes you into this next garden room. Again, the English boxwoods anchoring the corners. But in this garden room, we see a much greater expanse of lawn. And here we start seeing, again, the typical English type of landscape in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, um, with the expanse of lawn, the use of plant material, and instead of flowers again, Steel used plants that were sustainable, that he didn't have to do a lot of work on, that were uh, resilient in the landscape. So we see the azaleas, the crepe myrtles to give you height. Um, some of the uh, tropicals we see over here, the hedikiums, the gingers, and also um, the sago palms. So again, that layered kind of green textured landscape um, was typical of steel burden's design. To frame us and lead us into the next part of the landscape, um, we come to the pathway that's anchored on either side by these cast iron garden urns. And walking down again the pea gravel path here, um, we come to the third garden room, which was one of the last designs uh, that Steel Burden implemented. And as we walk down this path, one of the things that I'm reminded of is the devastations that hurricanes can cause and that Hurricane Gustav caused not only to our community, but to Windrush Gardens. Um, this big red oak right here was actually put in place of over a hundred year old red oak that came down and smashed a good part of Windrush Gardens. So we've put a lot of time and energy in restoration and renovation of these gardens. Um, we've been doing that on a principled uh, cultural landscape report that was created by Susan Turner Associates that directs us to maintain the landscape or restore the landscape as Steel Burden had left it um, after he had implemented it from his design. So that's what we follow today to maintain the landscape and what we're using in the restoration process. And so Garden Room 3 is the next garden room that we're working on currently in the restoration process. Okay, moving into garden room three, um, you can see that this landscape looks much younger, um, and that's because we've done a tremendous amount of restoration work very recently. 
Um, you can see the new plantings of uh, crepe myrtles, new plantings of azaleas. But you can also use, notice that there's a heavy use of statuary in this garden, more so than other parts. So Steel Burden began to use even more statuary to ornament the garden, but also to lead your eye, not all the way down the path, but so that it would stop at part of the pathway and give you that interest to move on to the next part of the garden. So if we come into garden room three, you can see even a much greater expanse of lawn. Um, so it's a much bigger garden area. And this statuary here actually has a wonderful story behind it. Um, we have Hippomenes over here, and on the other end of the garden, we have Atalanta. And so the story goes, it's a, a mythological story that Atalanta was a beautiful woman. She had a lot of men that were very interested in marrying her, um, but uh, she was also a great athlete. And so what she decided to do was she challenged any man to a race, and if he could beat her, then he could have her hand. Well, Hippomenes, being the creative man that he was, um, decided to take a golden apple, and he held that golden apple when he challenged her to the race, and just before the finish line, he dropped the golden apple. Atalanta reached down to pick it up, and he beat her in the race, and thus he had her hand and got married to Atalanta. So another charming story and kind of uh, a wonderful, uh, if you will, part of Windrush Gardens. Now let's head back out of uh, Garden Room 3, uh, back towards um, the back part of the landscape, part of the original uh, garden that Steele created, uh, to give you a little insight on who, more who Steele Burden was and what inspired his uh, landscape technique. One of the things that, again, we have to remember, he didn't have a lot of funds. He left no drawings. Steele never drew anything on paper. Everything was in his head. And so the way he laid out his gardens was either by chalk or flower. And he would simply take the chalk or flower, go through the yard, the area, and lay out the beds. And it's said that he very seldom had to go back and recreate or redesign the bed. It was all in his head and he put it down right the first time. So he would create the, the garden beds and then begin to implement the garden. Um, Steele also um, was, as I mentioned earlier, a self-taught artist. So Steele, not having a lot of money, but loved sculptures and statuary in the garden, didn't have funds to purchase them. So what he would do is he would do a painting or some of his small figurines that he liked to do, and he would trade them or barter them for the statuary in the garden. Again, leading your eye to the end of the garden, we have uh, young Hermes here whispering into Zeus's ear about the mischievousness of the gods. So coming to the back of garden room one, um, we, see, we see where Steel Burden has spent a good part of his life. Um, because he was living in a two-room house with his mom and his sister, um, he decided to create his own space, and so he built himself a bachelor pad, or a man cave, if you will. So here you can see kind of Steele's architectural design here, a simple structure with a slate roof, the little restroom to the side with a quirky little arch that he put onto it. So uh, again, kind of a look into uh, Steel, Steel Burden's mind and his uh, design style. Also, if we go inside the garden studio, you can also kind of uh, peek into Steel Burton's life uh, and see uh, just, just what made him tick. So if we look in here, uh, we can see some of the furniture, the sculptures that he's surrounded with, artwork that he's surrounded himself with. And this is where he would spend his days, um, both painting, sculpting, coming up with new landscapes, and also uh, a lot of people visited him out here. So as we move back into the garden, um, one of the things that uh, the Burden family had was a strong connection to LSU. Miss Ione, as Dean of Student Affairs, Steele Burden, um, many people don't know, was the landscaper on LSU campus for over 30 years. So from about 1930 to 1960, Steele Burden implemented the landscape on campus. So the wonderful Live Oak Alleys, the Great Kirk, crepe myrtles, ligustrums that you see on LSU campus, the older plantings, that was planted by Steel Burden. So Steel Burden had a very strong connection to LSU campus. Um, 
he found some old agricultural equipment on campus and he asked if he could move it out to Burden and he started the creation of the Rural Life Museum that we have today that's next to Windrush Gardens. So um, the Burden family not only being tied to the community was tied to LSU. So the three children uh, not having any children of their own decided that they need to figure out what they were going to do with the property after they had passed away. So being that connection to LSU and LSU had Ag Center had started doing some research out here in the fields they decided that, that they would donate it to um, LSU. So LSU A&M uh, maintains the Rural Life Museum and the LSU Ag Center maintains the gardens and, and the fields and the woodlands and the gardens in front. So this is something that we're very fortunate to have right in the middle of Baton Rouge, 440 acres of green space um, that the community can enjoy, but also that our students, staff and faculty can come out and enjoy and do research and educational programming as well. So. Um, I invite you to come out and enjoy Windrush Gardens any time that you would like. It's open seven days a week, almost year round. You access the property through uh, the Rural Life Museum for a small fee. Uh, and you can also buy a family pass uh, for a minimal amount that will get you in the gardens year round. Um, this gardens, again, is a historic gardens. Uh, you think of many historic gardens across the United States and the world where, you know, were designed and built by a fabulously wealthy family. This garden is unique in that it was designed and built by a very humble family, a family of simple means, yet it's a wonderful, beautiful place to cherish. And in the words of Steel Burden, you know, he said that this garden was meant to be a place of serenity where you could enjoy the peacefulness of gardens, but also contemplate the days, contemplate the days gone by. So I encourage you to come out, enjoy the serenity of the gardens and contemplate days gone by.